Greetings, and welcome to the first of five planned lectures on polyliteracy, a series of lectures that will be given on Tuesday afternoons that are designed to give potential foreign language students a complete systematic overview of everything they can expect to encounter when they embark upon the study of a foreign language and to provide them with what they need to know in order to do that uh, successfully. So I am using as a textbook for this series, this book, New Ways to Learn a Foreign Language, which has five parts. And today we're going to be looking at part one, which is called Learning Another Language. So by way of introduction, as I just said, this course is really for anybody who wants to embark upon learning a foreign language. Most people are what I would call normal learners. Normal learners are human beings who have other things going on in their busy lives and who decide for some reason that they want or need to add learning a foreign language to that mix of their lives. And they would obviously, if they're going to embark upon something, they hope to succeed. They hope to get something out of it. Uh, they would like to do it efficiently. Um, they would probably like to do it easily as possible, which is not necessarily a realistic goal, but uh, it's something that one can aspire to. So to learn a language easily and efficiently and effectively, um, they might have some general goal to speak it well. They might be aspiring to pass some sort of test or proficiency exam in it. But in any case, normal learners generally are striving to learn a specific language. It might be French, it might be Korean, it might be some other specific language, but that is their aim to learn that language, language X. Uh, they might possibly have a language Y on the horizon, but probably not, and probably certainly not a language Z. They're focused on learning one particular language, and that's why I call them normal, language, normal learners. They're not um, obsessed with learning languages. They're not uh, going out of their way to think, I'm going to devote my life to learning foreign languages. There are a class of people out there who are this way, and they're the people that I associate with. I'm one. Uh, there are people that we are afflicted with something that I might call polyitis. The desire uh, arises in your breast at a certain point when you've been a normal learner, you have to start out that way, uh, that you think, well, I, I kind of like this procedure. This is fun and interesting. I want to learn more languages. I do have a language Y on the horizon. I've got a language Z. And then you remember that book by Dr. Seuss, On Beyond Zebra, where there's a whole new alphabet of all other letters, and you want to learn them all. So polyitis is a condition that afflicts you when you say, I want to learn lots of languages. You go from uh, needing to learn a language to enjoying learning languages to um, making it sort of your hobby and then making it your passion and making it your obsession and uh, making it your life. And so polyitis can affect, generally it tends to affect the, the tongue and the ear. Uh, and you want to speak, you want to hear languages and speak them, you want to communicate with people, you want to travel around the world and speak to them. So uh, if you have this condition, you're a polyglot, or you're a polyglot want to be or a polyglot aspirant before you've done it, and then if you work long and hard at it, you turn around one day and you have done it, you've learned six or a dozen languages and you're a polyglot. Sometimes this condition affects more the, the eyes and the fingers and you want to read and write languages more than you want to speak them, and you're interested not just in traveling around the world and meeting people and doing this. Now you're interested in traveling through time and going back and reading things that might have been written a hundred or a thousand years ago and uh, reading things that have lasted a thousand years. They're usually significant works, uh, and so you're interested in reading important uh, historical spiritual monuments. So if you have this condition, you're afflicted with polyliteracy, and some people have both. So whether you're a normal learner or polyglot or polyliterate, uh, this book should hopefully have something in it for you. Continuing the introduction, let me introduce myself. Who am I? My name is Alexander Arguez. I have been afflicted with polyitis for a long time. Uh, when I started in college, I went to Colombia and I majored in French and German literature, and I also did a lot of Spanish. Uh, I taught myself Spanish at that point, uh, but I learned Latin and Greek and uh, Sanskrit while I was there. 
And then I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago, where I got my doctorate, and it was kind of interdisciplinary. I focused on comparative history of religions using the older Germanic language family principally. I went through a whole sequence of older Germanic languages and ended up writing my doctoral dissertation on Old Norse mythological and religious dreams symbolism in the Old Norse sagas. And uh, before I leave Chicago, let me say that both Chicago and Columbia are great books schools. This is the universities where Mortimer Adler was a long time ago and developed his great book series, the concept of reading really significant works uh, of, of literature and history and philosophy and these kind of things to enrich your mind and do this in discussion circles and seminar forms. And uh, the core curricula of the colleges of both these institutes is uh, structured in this way. So I'm a product of that kind of education, very much a believer in it. Um, then I got to do postdoctoral research in Germany, and it was focused on older Germanic languages first, but once I got there, having had my philological background, uh, I was encountering living languages, and so I got polyglottery, polyglottitis, and uh, liked learning living languages and wanted more of a challenge, so embarked on a quarter century's career as a university professor in various continents, in, in Korea and in Lebanon and in uh, in Dubai, uh, and so I could learn Korean and Arabic principally, um, to very difficult languages from different cultures that I've spent uh, about nine years each immersed in and, and trying to uh, develop high competencies in. Uh, I've also had positions as um, a language specialist or a teacher trainer of teacher trainers at an organization in Singapore with a very long name, the Southeast Asian Ministries of Education Organization Regional Language Center. And uh, most recently, I've been a director of intensive immersion programs at Concordia Language Villages in Minnesota. So I've been involved in language education and language learning um, pretty much my whole professional career. Um, and you can see and hear strands through that of comparative literature, of uh, comparative, comparative religions, comparative linguistics, comparative philology, comparative keeps coming back, great books. Um, and all of these strands have always been tied together in my life in a way that I needed to find a way to articulate and give, give voice to a bit more. Uh, and so this is what I'm ending up calling polyliteracy. And I find that as a polyglot or as a polyliterate person, after you learn many languages, you're faced with the lifelong challenge of maintaining them and using them. And the ways that I have found to do that, particularly as a polyliterate person, are things that I've shared most recently in terms of the scriptorium video and, and this kind of thing, um, are to me uh, a way of life akin to a kind of practice, like you might practice some form of exercise or meditation or yoga or something. So that's my overall take on, on what I am and, and what I'm doing. Um, so today I am presenting New Ways to Learn a Foreign Language, this book here, and I'm presenting a commentary on it. Scriptorium, which I just talked about, is, is a medieval technique of copying manuscripts, and I'm a great lover of the Middle Ages and medieval thought, and um, commentaries were a very medieval tradition back when you would uh, if, you were, if you weren't just a monk making a, a copy of something in, a, in the scriptorium, you were a scholar making your own copy of it, you would write commentaries on it. And so, for example, the one of the greatest thinkers of, of all time, Abu Walid uh, Muhammad ibn Ahmed ibn Rushd, ibn Rushd Aberui, known through history as the commentator, is the person who rediscovered Aristotle, basically, who'd been lost for a thousand years and brought him through Andalusian Spain to Thomas Aquinas to, to medieval Europe. And he's known through history as the, the commentator. So when he, when he made in his scriptory, when he made his copies of Aristotle, he didn't just copy, he, he wrote his ideas on it. So that's what I'm going to be doing with this book, presenting the structure, the organized outline of it, because I am working on my own systematic uh, presentation of all that I know about languages, and I like to see how others have done this and structured that, so this is helpful to me also to, to go through this and do this. Um, I'm very far from being Ibn Rushd. This is not Aristotle's Poetics, and its author, Robert A. Hall, is certainly no Aristotle, but this is by way of analogy. Who was Robert A. Hall? Um, he was a, an American scholar of the earlier, middle part of the 20th century. 
Um, he was a professor of Italian in specific, uh, Romance languages in general. He had a complete historical perspective of the Romance language family. He published books on Proto-Romance, so before it differentiated into Latin and all the other languages. And he was also a specialist in, in Haitian and other types of Creole and Pidgin forms of, of, of French and Spanish, which he regarded as legitimate evolutions of the family and not generally, as most people look at them, as, as sort of bastardized forms of inferior forms of the language. Um, he also was extremely, played an extremely important role in the Second World War in developing a method by which American soldiers and Americans before the Second World War had been very isolationist and didn't know lots of foreign languages and now they needed to go and go all over the world and have people trained to speak these languages. So uh, he was one of the main people that developed a method that very successfully proved that regular people could learn languages fast and well when that was thought to be something that couldn't happen. And that method afterwards was taken by the, the spoken language services and put into um, a whole series of spoken language series books. And I did a review of them a long time ago, 10 or 12 years ago, when I did a series of books that are still around. They're kind of dated. They still have, they have that 1940s or 50s feel to them, but um, this series is, is out there as uh, a way of embodying the way that he, he learned to teach languages. So um, today we're going to look at part one, learning another language, and I'm going to give the chapter outline here, and I'll put a timestamp on it because this lecture is probably going to take about an hour, which is normal for a university lecture, unusual here for YouTube. Many people might get impatient, want to go ahead to look just at chapter one, the language learning problem, chapter two, why learn foreign languages, chapter three, what are the difficulties, and chapter four, ways of learning languages. So I'll put the timestamps here so you can just go to those. But uh, I'm embarking upon this as if it were uh, a university lecture, and I had an hour or so to present a full um, full stream of, of thought. So here we go. <clears throat> Chapter one, the language learning problem. Um, Hall opens this by talking about the fact, uh, particularly in the American context, there's a chronic complaints about ineffective foreign language learning. So many people are, you've probably met them, maybe you're one yourself, um, say things like, I studied a language for so many years in school and I can't speak it. Uh, it's, it's, it was a waste of time. Um, I have encountered in the many countries that I've lived in, I've never been in a country where the society said, we're happy with the way that uh, we have our languages taught in school. Um, Singapore and Lebanon, which are multilingual societies, sometimes you look at them and wow, are all Lebanese trilingual? Well, yeah, they have problems mixing their languages. In Singapore, likewise, uh, um, in Korea or in uh, the United Arab Emirates, where they're trying to make English more of their lingua franca international language. This is at the cost of their Korean and Arabic. So there are, there are issues in every society that I've lived in about how languages are taught, both from the individual perspective. I spent a lot of time and effort and didn't get much from it. And from the societal perspective, what, what's happening in our society with language learning. Um, he calls this an immediate pressing problem with a need for drastic improvement. And um, I I'm inclined to agree by uh, my sensibilities, but on the other hand, um, there hasn't been any improvement since 1965 when he first wrote this book, and uh, we're still plunking along, so it must not be that pressing, or somehow we're able to give her. It's just a chronic part of the human condition, given that we speak so many different languages and need to learn them, and it is, is can be a challenge. Um, he talks about the fact that this is, um, the well, in any given society, you have at a certain point um, a need for people who know specific languages. Uh, we have a lot of Somali refugees now. We need people who know Somali to work in the police force or the hospitals, or um, we're getting embroiled in Afghanistan again. We need people who know Pashto and Dari. Uh, for specific reasons, um, there always tends to be kind of a chronic shortage of people who know specific languages. And his recipe, the reason he wrote this book, is he said, well, let's not just try to say ad hoc, now we need people who know this language, but the better ideal is, and I'm going to give you some quotes uh, for chapter one uh, that I think are good to think about and chew over, and I do intend to have a, a discussion circle after this um, 
this lecture, and perhaps these are some of the things that we can discuss. So some of the quotes from chapter one are, he says that what we should have is a widely diffused knowledge of how to go about learning any new language with which we may be confronted. So the goal in this book is not to help you learn French or Korean, but to be prepared to learn any language that comes your way. And if this is something that could be provided uh, in the educational system, then that would indeed be a very good thing. If you have a clear understanding of the source of your difficulties and how to meet them, you can save a great deal of time and effort. Um, one thing that I've done over the years here on YouTube, on forums and other things, is people come to me for advice and counsel with, with their issues of, for planning and learning languages. And I would have to concur that uh, one part of the problem is that many people don't really understand why they're having, they know that they're having trouble, they know they're frustrated by this or that or the other thing, but they don't know what is causing that. They can pinpoint what the issue is, but they don't know why they're having the issue. So if there were a way to know that, that would be a very good thing. And that's something that uh, he, he promised us to give in subsequent chapters of this book. He says we should distinguish between the problems of language learning in general and the specific problems posed by the particular language you are working on. So again, this is something just to keep in mind, particularly if you're a normal language learner and you haven't embarked on this journey before. If you're a polyglot or polyliterate, you've probably stumbled through it. Um, you are going to have problems pronouncing any foreign language that you're trying to learn, but uh, then you need to say, well, in a specific one, what are the specific problems? This is just another good principle to remember. And then I like this one. The book is intended to give a technique not for learning some specific language, but for acquiring any foreign language. Naturally, the fifth or tenth language will come easier than the first, simply as a result of practice in the art of picking up a language. But it's not necessary to wait until one's fifth or tenth language to realize that such a technique exists and can be learned and used with profit. So this is very much along the lines that I've always kind of thought about, that, that an ideal language learning academy would be a place where you, um, you coach and mentor people to learn on their own, teach them what they need to know uh, so that they can use this to, to better and more easily learn languages. You don't need to have stumbled through the experience. Uh, if, if he or I or somebody has stumbled through it and we can impart that, then hopefully you don't need to stumble as much. Catch also, he says, by your 10th language, he's obviously learned 10 languages. So uh, he's a professor, a linguist from a time period in the past when it was, I think, common for linguists to, to be polyglots. Uh, uh, these days, many linguists of my personal acquaintance um, are very far from that. They might be interested in the theory of language, but that's not necessarily in learning any particular foreign language, which is an enigma to me. So let's get into chapter two, why learn foreign languages? This is interesting here. He gives um, uh, lots of examples of the fact that in the world as a whole, there are a lot of negative attitudes towards foreign language study. Um, you're probably gonna tell people you're starting to learn a language and they say, why bother? You're wasting your time. It's not, it's not you don't need to do that. It's, um, you will encounter this. You will encounter it on a societal level, even if society says it's important to do it when languages are always the first things cut from school budgets and, and, uh, and not really supported or uh, endeavored. And then when this kind of thing is all around you, uh, it's very easily to internalize this uh, attitude and to sort of embark on the process with an unconscious negative attitude. I mean, you might, when you're setting out to learn a foreign language, particularly as a normal learner, again, as a polyglot or a polyliterate, you've been afflicted with this desire, this love of languages, this will be a thing of the past, but many normal learners, I would say, you're consciously telling yourself, yeah, I wanna learn this, I need to learn this, but frankly, you don't really wanna do it. It's in your heart, uh, psychologically, your brain knows, hey, I already speak a language fluently and I'm never gonna speak this language as well as I'm doing it and I have to work hard at it. I'm reinventing the wheel, what's the point? So um, negative attitudes are definitely always a stumbling block, so we need to be aware of those. <clears throat> Then he goes into four major headings of why people study foreign languages. And this seems very, um, I don't wanna say eccentric, but uh, almost, I, I don't really understand why he comes up with the four that he does. And I come up with some others on my own on the next slide, but let's go through what he says. He says that 
Obviously, one reason for learning languages, the main reason most people have, is direct communication. They want to speak with other people. And he gives examples of people traveling, of missionaries, all things that are perfectly reasonable. This one is just fine by me. Uh, and then I like this, but it seems strange that he includes under this to expand their intellectual and cultural horizons. I love that, but to me, that's not really part of uh, direct communication. I would put that in a separate category. Then he talks about the reading objective. And this, to me, I think this might still be out there. Uh, in the first form that he talks about um, is when he says about reading scientific literature. I do think that this might be a little bit dated, uh, that perhaps in the 1960s when he's writing this, the arms race is on, the Soviet Union is quite strong. Probably there were a lot of, of astrophysics journals written in Russian that an American astrophysicist might need to read. So he just wants to read Russian. He doesn't have the time or the interest or the need to, to speak it. So he might just want to learn to read it. So and that I still saw this when I was at the University of Chicago. They have a, a reading and um, a reading exam in French and German that you just need to spend 90 minutes uh, and translate one paragraph with a dictionary just to show that you can do that. So it's uh, to be able to go into scientific journals, scholarly journals, and, and look at other languages. So um, that, as an academic, you probably saw that as a major objective, but I think that's a relatively minor one. It affects us, or me, or people who are interested in my videos a bit more, in terms of looking at dead languages for polyliteracy. So uh, the reading objective, um, you might be, you know, if you're looking at, <clears throat> at, at um, ancient Egyptian or uh, Sumerian or Middle High German. These are not spoken anymore. These are dead languages. Um, so he seems to be saying, well, it's, it's okay to just have a reading objective for them, but I'll get into this more a little bit later in my commentary. I question whether this is all that one can do. I think one can do more with, um, with so-called so dead languages. Then he also brings this up, and I like this, but it doesn't seem to me to be a major um, <clears throat> major reason that is really supported by society as a whole the principle of linguistic and cultural relativity. I think this is a great reason, but I don't think it's all that common, one of the major headings. And he goes further, he says, it's not only helpful, but necessary for every person to have some knowledge of at least one other way of talking in order to realize that his or her own way of talking and living is not the only or even the most reasonable one. So <clears throat> I would love to live in a society where this was sort of a a central kernel of the educational principle, um, but um, I don't really think that that's that widespread. Then he talks about, uh, as a major reason, uh, as an object of study in its own right. So he's talking about linguistics here, and um, heads up polyglots, he does have a, a slightly uh, superior attitude here that scientific analysis is, uh, is superior to what he calls mere polyglotism. Um, so he thinks that analyzing and looking and seeing the structure of language being fascinated by the phenomena of language is okay, but for some reason you should want to study it and not just speak it. So here I'm gonna embark upon my first real commentary slide section. Uh, I'm gonna look at a different group of motives, a different way of categorizing them. And as I said, I've been working for ages on my own treatise on, on, on everything that I know about language learning, and this is excerpted from that. Uh, I would categorize more nine reasons under three headings rather than he has four headings and a couple of subheadings. And I'm also going to give this the catchy title, the more the better, because um, looking at his reasons, I don't see that it's something that one can build on, but I think that in terms of preparing yourself to succeed in learning a language, the more motives, the more reasons you have, the better. And some of these are under your control. You can try to get them. You can try to build them in if you don't have them. So the first broad heading that I would see is what I would call practical and utilitarian goals. Um, this is when, first of all, uh, often there's external compulsion. You're made to learn a language. When you're in school and they tell you you have to learn a language, you have to learn a language. Um, if, you're, uh, if you are a citizen of, of, of the United Arab Emirates or of Korea and English is, is encroaching as a global language and everybody's learning it, you're made to do that. Um, if you're born in 
Brooklyn, New York, to parents whose last name is Finkelstein. When you're 13 years old, you're going to find yourself getting ready for your bar mitzvah in, 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 in the synagogue, learning Hebrew. You didn't choose to do that. It doesn't matter. You, it's been chosen for you. So external compulsion. Um, then there's real present need. Uh, I give the example here in, in, in Minnesota. There are Somali refugees, uh, and people who work with them in hospitals need to speak with them. Um, maybe you're getting married to somebody from a different society and you want to speak with your in-laws or you're being transferred to a job in a different society and you have a need to sp specifically learn the specific language. Um, and then there is what I would call calculated benefit. Maybe you don't need to know this language right now, but you know that, you know, hey, you know, I want to go into diplomacy and French is still a diplomatic language. So if, it's, if I know French, I'm going to get ahead in my career better than uh, if I don't. Um, I'm, I'm an astrophysicist and maybe the Cold War is over, but there's still a lot of stuff written in Russian. So if I learn Russian while I'm in college, um, I will be, have a better chance of, <clears throat> of, of doing research later on. The second broad category that I see is direct cultural interest. Uh, direct cultural interest might be a search for your roots. Immigrants in this world where people move around a lot uh, might lose contact with their heritage in one generation and want to get it back in another generation. People like to go into looking where they come from. So um, people are generally most interested uh, in their own roots. <clears throat> um, cultural curiosity, I would say, is when you're interested in, in roots that might not be your own. You just happen somehow something catches your interest. Maybe it's a news article. Maybe it's something that you see or visit. Something about a culture catches your interest and you want to learn more about it. And cultural curiosity can, and ideally should, hopefully will, blossom into cultural affinity. Um, cultural curiosity may be what, what's very popular right now, Korean dramas, Squid Game. You watch Squid Game, cultural curiosity, you want to watch other Korean dramas because you like that, and you start to be interested in Korean society, and you like the sound of the language, and you want to develop it. So you get cultural affinity for, for Korean that way. Then there's what I call indirect intellectual interests. Indirect intellectual interests are, some of them, using the same categories that Hall does, I would call philological curiosity, linguistic interest. I've always felt, personally, just languages are fascinating. Some people find rocks fascinating. Some people find butterflies fascinating. Some people find languages fascinating. Looking at languages, figuring out how they work, figuring out how they sound, that's just interesting, philological curiosity. Then there's mental expansion. I think that goes back to the one that he said. Well, if you can really get your mind open to the fact that the way that you think is not the only way to think, that's that's a good thing. And the point that I've made often in the past is that, um, yes, you are limited uh, if you only know one language or even a few languages. And the fact is, anthropologically, it's it's not unusual, not strange for human beings to know five or six languages. And so that's sort of claiming your Heritage is, is having a mind that can think in lots of different categories. So to expand your mind is a good way for a good motive for learning languages. And to do that, we just kind of go hand in hand. That is a form of mental exercise. I think it's got some play years back that learning a foreign language might help you delay the onset of Alzheimer's. Um, but beyond that, um, mental exercise is like spiritual exercise. Mental exercise is a form of 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 yeah, once you've, once you've experienced physical exercise, if you've gotten in shape and then you feel yourself getting out of shape, you notice it. Mental exercise is the same way. So when you use your brain um, in, in a way that um, stretches it, um, to me, learning languages can be very much akin to mindful meditation, mindfulness, and, and other forms of sort of yoga-like practice. So <clears throat> as I go back up here, the more the better. Um, yes. Probably most people, when you start learning a language, you've got reasons one or two, external compulsion or real present need. Um, and these can carry you a while, but um, if you can add some of these others, and these are under your control, some of them, uh, then you have a better chance at, at succeeding in your task of, of learning a foreign language. Chapter three is <clears throat> so what are the difficulties that you can expect to encounter in learning a foreign language? general difficulties. Um, and he says that, uh, this is true, each language has features that differ from other other languages. 
Um, and the problem is that you really need to study these features on their own terms. And this is particularly acute for normal language learners who haven't learned another language yet. That's almost impossible to do. It's natural that you, under, you understand things through the lens of your own language, your learner's language. So that's the first major problem that you're going to encounter learning your first or your second language. As you pointed out, by the time you get to your fifth or your tenth language, this is not really an issue anymore. So um, he goes on into the specific difficulties. Um, there's pronunciation is the first thing you encounter. Language is a spoken phenomenon. So there's pronunciation difficulties in terms of individual sounds or phonemes. Some languages have a th sound, others do not have that. Some languages have a n sound, other languages don't have it. If you come from a language that doesn't have it, it's hard to hear it, it's hard to make it. Um, some languages have multiple varieties of what we would all consider in English to be a t sound. They have a da, da, da. They all sound the same, uh, and you have a problem differentiating them. So um, there are lots of sounds out there, and not all languages use all of them, and learning how to hear them and make them is a challenge. <clears throat> Beyond individual sounds, there's the rhythm that speech has. And rhythm is largely determined by stress, where the stress comes in a sentence, how often it falls, how often the syllables are stressed. Some languages sound like mm, 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 mm. Some languages sound like mm, 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 mm. They have different rhythms like this. And so there are people, sometimes they work very hard on getting the individual sounds, and maybe they are pronouncing them correctly, but they still use the speech rhythm, the intonation of their native language when they speak the foreign language. And even though the sounds are correct, it doesn't sound right. It might even sound unintelligible. <clears throat> um, then there are issues with raising and lowering of pitch in particular tones. So this is particularly pronounced with Chinese and Vietnamese and other languages that are so-called tonal languages where um, you, when you when you say things with a different pitch or intonation, you're not expressing as we do in English. If I say what what that that I'm saying the same thing, but I'm showing that I'm surprised or I'm angry. Whereas in Chinese, I might end up saying totally different words. Then there's grammar. Grammar is the traffic laws, the rules of how things are put together. And grammar is something that people learn unconsciously and their native language, but get a feeling that something is right or wrong, and then they can study the rules of their own language, and then that helps them, but it also really trips them up when they go and they learn another language. And grammar is, quite frankly, it's fascinating, I love it, but to be honest, it's, it's, it's random. It doesn't have to be the way that it is. It's a set of conventions that exist. Some languages have grammatical gender. Instead of saying a book is it, this might be a he or it might be a she. Why does it have to be that way? That's sort of a random convention, but it sounds right or wrong if the language works that way. Um, some languages, um, if you say, how, how do I say something? I have to answer, well, are you a man or a woman? You have to say it differently depending on your gender. Um, there are all sorts of issues in grammar uh, that can really trip you up when you first encounter these differences. <clears throat> then there's syntax or word order. Um, some languages are very flexible in this, and some languages are very fixed, and uh, depending on where you come from and what you're learning, this can be a major issue. Um, there's cultural categorization. Uh, Hall gives the example of colors. This is a famous, famous fact that languages break colors up differently. Uh, the colors that we describe in English as being different might be lumped together uh, in various other languages. Maybe uh, green and blue might be the same word in some languages, or black and purple and blue might all be the same languages. Or maybe there are languages that have colors that we, we don't have words for. Um, so colors are, are one categorization and then ties together with grammar. There are languages when <coughs> uh, in, instead of saying, um, using your verbs to show who's doing something. You use your verbs to show the level of respect or relationship between people. And this is just something you have to build into your, your understanding. So, um, and finally, there are always idiomatic expressions. These are things that you can't look up word for word in a dictionary. Uh, they just are, they come together and they mean something. And some languages are very rich in these, poetic in these, and uh, these, these are all difficulties that you might encounter um, in spoken language. <clears throat> what Hall is suggesting here, and again, I, I love the idea, 
um, is that we prepare people to know about these difficulties ahead of time. So some sort of preparatory class to let people know about these things are coming up. Uh, and again, I love that idea, but I, I also have encountered in my own life that this kind of good mannered, good, good intentioned preparation can backfire and turn into intimidation. It can turn into leading people to make mountains out of molehills. When you tell them about the tones in Chinese, I think I was affected by this myself. It becomes a very intimidating thought and then it becomes a difficulty that you create. Whereas if you had just gone and tried to speak it, perhaps you, you wouldn't have encountered it necessarily in such a strong form. Likewise with, with grammar, if you describe it too much as being very complicated and difficult, then people will experience that way. Um, so um, yes, this is a good way idea to have some preparation, but uh, care needs to be taken that it's not done in a way that uh, could intimidate or frighten people. <clears throat> um, I also think, and this is not for normal learners, this is for polyglots and, and polyliterate people, that a lot of these difficulties can be alleviated or systematically put aside if you have a, a systematic plan for learning, an ideal systematic plan. Again, this is um, years back uh, when people asked me lots of advice. People would say, okay, what order should I learn my languages in? Um, what, what, should I learn this first? I'm interested in both, and is it, does it make a difference? And there are ways that it does. There are ways that if you say, okay, if, if I go stepwise, from similar languages or easier languages, languages that have fewer difficulties or fewer differences from my language, I can alleviate some of the stress of learning these things and I will get more experience in encountering these difficulties. And then when I come to the more difficult or the more different language, um, it will be less of a challenge because I will have that experience that I wouldn't otherwise have had. So I might be equally interested in uh, a difficult language and an interesting and an easy language, and I might be inclined to go off and learn the difficult language, but if I learn the easier language first, even if that easier language is totally unrelated to the difficult language, the experience of learning the easier language will make learning the difficult language less difficult. <clears throat> Um, continuing with some of the written difficulties that he talks about and adding quite a bit here on my own, um, he talks about writing systems and in the writing systems he mentions the ways that um, what we're looking at right now is the, the Latin alphabet, English is written in the Latin alphabet, and uh, it is the most common alphabet out there in the world. So if you're an English speaker, that might seem like a good thing. You don't have to learn a new alphabet. Um, that can be a good thing, but it can also be um, a, a trap because these things are not pronounced the same in uh, different languages. And if you see something that looks similar, you're inclined to want to pronounce it in the same way when in point of fact it's different. Whereas if it, it looked different, you wouldn't think that it was pronounced in the same way. So. Generally, it is less of a burden to learn languages that also use the Latin alphabet, um, but it, it can bring traps of its own. Uh, what you will encounter if you haven't done so already is that English is uh, sort of naked looking. English is one of the few languages that doesn't have any diacritical marks or accents. These two dots written over the vowels, the umlaut uh, or the accent, the accent grave, circonflexe, aigu or the little tail, Cécile, and in French, these are other letters that you'll see, and you have to learn how to write and pronounce these. Stepwise, we're going through difficulties into other languages. The next step is when you have not diacritical marks, but you have what I would call sister alphabet shapes. You have languages that evolve from the same origin as the Latin alphabet, in parallel with the Latin alphabet, that have some letters that look the same as in the Latin alphabet. So here it's the word Ruski, written in Cyrillic alphabet, and that's not a P, that's an R. That's not a, that's not a Y, that's a, an U. That's not a, a C, that's an S. Here you have Elenica, okay? That's an E. That's also sort of an E-like sound. It looks like an N. This here is the N. So you have some letters that look the same and some letters that look different. Um, then you come to learning other alphabets. You have, for example, Devanagari, which is used for writing Hindi and Sanskrit and Marathi and many other Eng Indian languages. And you have ha Hangul, uh, which is used only for writing Korean, which is a shame because this is considered to be one of the most 
the easiest alphabets to learn and the most phonetic, so it might be used well for other languages. And then you have read the other way, al-Arabiya, uh, alphabet for writing Arabic and Persian and Urdu and, and many other languages. So these are all things that you could learn to see like A, B, C, but uh, you have to totally retrain your eyes to do that. And then sort of glossing over his syllabaries, he goes on into morphemic systems. Uh, he gives the example of Chinese, but so Egyptian and Mayan and a number of other ancient scripts are also basically picture writing, hieroglyphs, where um, uh, you are, he doesn't like calling them ideas, um, more morphemes, but uh, you have to write a specific shape to, con to convey an idea or a form. And these are um, very difficult to master. Whether you're Chinese or you're not Chinese, it takes longer uh, to learn to read and write Chinese than it does to write an alphabetic system. Plus, uh, and I hope this is true, I take great pleasure in, in believing that it's true, um, it takes constant practice. So there are points in my life uh, to help me learn Korean. I learned lots and lots of Chinese characters. There were stages in my life when I have thousands of characters memorized and by not practicing them, sometimes I feel like I, I couldn't write a single one right now. And I think I've heard that they, uh, in the Cultural Revolution, they would take intellectuals and put them in labor camps and not let them read or write for 10 or 12 years, and then they would become illiterate and they could let them out. I don't know if that's a true or not, but I like to think that it is because it's very hard to, um, to continue to learn and read and write Chinese and Egyptian and Mayan. As a commentary here, uh, particularly for those interested in polyliteracy, but anybody who wants to learn to read and write them, I find that there's an incredible need for handwriting, using your hand to write things down. Not stressed enough in most of the textbooks or ways that I've seen of learning. Uh, any writing system um, is easier uh, if you, rather than just try to read it, learn the forms, maybe type it. Um, if you do a lot of handwriting practice, it makes it a lot easier to learn the language, which is one reason I stress my scriptorium uh, method that I've presented recently. Sticking with issues that are particularly pertinent to the polyliterate more than other learners, uh, apart from the writing system themselves, there is the difficulty of written language is stylistic. Um, it's a simple fact that writing is generally done, often done in a different register from speaking. Writing is done in a higher register. Register is the way that you speak differently when you're talking to your friends and when you're talking to your grandmother or your boss or the president. You have different levels of politeness and formality. And written language is generally at a higher, more formal register than spoken language. So when you have just learned to speak and then you try to start reading, it can be frustrating because, oh, all of a sudden it's, it's somehow, it seems like you're at a higher level and now you can't follow as much. That's also very much the case because of vocabulary range. It is a fact that spoken language uses far fewer words than written language. Um, written language and different types of writing, uh, there's all sorts of research that's been done. I've done a little myself in the past, made some videos about vocabulary range and what you need to know in order to read a novel or watch a movie. And it, it, uh, it can be quite extensive compared to what you need to converse with. So vocabulary range is a, is, is a hurdle. Um, and then beyond vocabulary range, vocabulary is used in different ways. They're just literary conventions, again, that are, that are different from spoken conventions and that you just need to um, get used to. So uh, it's not just the register and the vocabulary when you're reading a novel in Arabic, but the whole way that the, the the, the, the ideas are formulated can be a challenge that is different from the spoken language if you haven't learned the written language specifically, which is one reason why I particularly favor learning modern standard Arabic rather than any dialect. Arabic is a perfect example of a language too that pushes this to the extreme of diglossia, the way you write in Arabic. All Arabs only write one way, modern standard Arabic, but they speak in a wide variety of dialects. Swiss German might take this to the extreme, more familiar extreme for some people. There are languages where um, you, you really write in a very different way from the way that you speak. So these are issues that you might encounter. <laughs> so likewise here, I would just say as a commentary, um, in order to overcome these things, you do need a good method, you do need good materials, you do need good techniques, but you also need 
compared to what I have encountered out there in the world of, of language learners and particularly people who, who love poly, the idea of polyliteracy and want to start reading, um, there is a lack of a patience or really an understanding of, of it, it just does take a long time to work up to the level to be able to read um, a very different language with any degree of, of, of ease and fluidity. Um, now we get to the last chapter, which he calls Ways of Learning a Language. And my overall commentary here is that there's nothing new under the sun when I thought, okay, I'm going to uh, revise and, and comment on this book that is um, 55 years old or so. Uh, it's probably going to have to say there's a lot of new methods out there that he didn't mention. But after I started going through it, I realized, well, these things are done on apps or computers now, uh, but uh, there's nothing really different from the way that it was done back when he was describing it. It's the same basic procedure. So he says, interestingly enough, that the first main way of learning a language, and he might be going anthropologically, is contact with a model. And he doesn't seem to be talking about a teacher here. He just means um, like a child with its mother or like somebody who has landed in a uh, you know, in the, in, in, the, in the jungle and is adopted by some tribe there. I just, you have people and you go around and you, you imitate them um, consciously or unconsciously. Um, so he talks about contact with a model and that kind of contact with a model works best when you have the ideal of total immersion. And he talks, again, he is talking anthropologically here. Uh, in the past, in, in tradition, many traditional societies that practice exogamy, you would be married out of your tribe and into another tribe that might speak a totally different language, and you would just have to go there and live forever. And they, maybe they were all illiterate. They didn't have books. They didn't have grammar. They didn't have a way of teaching the language. You just had to go and, and, and deal with it and speak the way they spoke. So the ideal of total immersion is something that's still out there that people offer. People talk about it. Schools or programs say, come and offer total immersion. But again, this may have worked really well when that's it. That's your life. You're, you're sold into slavery. You're a captive. You're, you're married out. Uh, you're going to be there the rest of your life. It's very different from saying, OK, I'm going to go like I did to total immersion in Russia in the winter of 1999 or 2000. I was there for a week. No, I was there for, I was there for four, four weeks or six weeks. Um, that's, you know, not to, that's not total immersion. That's just immersed for that brief time period. So it's a short term actuality. Uh, and then Hall already is talking about, it. I think this has research has been proven more since since his time about the fact that this really works well in childhood. This worked well pre puberty, post puberty. This just doesn't work that well. Then he talks about the grammar method, the tried and traditional way of, of teaching Latin from the Middle Ages on, and because of Latin's influence as being the language, uh, other languages emulating the basically memorizing rules and paradigms, rules of, of everything. And Latin, well, I don't know, I mean, it, uh, this overall method of memorizing rules and paradigms seems to have fallen out for the most part in terms of modern learners. but. Uh, now, I think that's kind of surprising how many people still spend a lot of time and effort into memorizing vocabulary. And there, there are programs like that, vocabulary, and, and there are program apps for it, like Anki. People you know, like to talk about spaced repetition and how it helps them memorize vocabulary. But um, this is a wider topic, but I've never found any particular need to memorize specific vocabulary words as such. So uh, for the grammar method, for some reason, memorizing rules and paradigms, people don't like that so much, but a lot of people are still enamored of, of memorizing vocabulary. He also seems to be saying that the grammar method is OK for dead languages. Um, and this is certainly the way that I learned a lot of my dead languages, but I have come to question whether it is the only way, whether there might be other ways and better ways, and I'll talk about some of them on, on just, I think, the next screen or two. Then he talks about what he calls the direct method, and he gives its history, and this is still, I think this is out there as the ideal for a lot of people when you say, I, want, I do want the adult to learn as if he were a child. So I'm going to focus on exclusively using the target language. I'm going to give a lot of repetition. I'm not going to talk about grammar formally. I'm not going to present the rules. Um, the ideal here, I don't think this word existed back in Hall's time, acquisition. These days, people talk about acquisition versus learning. This is the ideal of, of acquisition. 
Um, then he talks about the phonetic approach, which I think is really dated and was used basically just for French particularly, which is one of his specialties back around in the early 1900s, uh, just focusing on the sounds more than anything else. Um, then he calls it the reading method or the school method. I would call it more the testing method, the way he describes it. And this is really, unfortunately, I think a major way that people get frustrated with their experience of learning languages. The teacher is not really trying to teach you um, how to learn the language. They're trying to teach you how to pass the test in the language. Um, and this is still, unfortunately, very common in, in many societies. Um, then there's the method that, again, he was one of the people that helped develop it. He calls it the Intensive Language Program, the ILP, uh, in his day because it was employed by the U.S. Army. People called it the Army Method. He doesn't like it, but the hallmarks of it are it's an oral approach. And I think the most important thing is you just spend more time on it. Learning languages takes hundreds of hours, and people tend to think I can do it in a weekend or I can do it in 30 hours or, or 30 days. It takes a long time. It takes a long number of contact hours, and this provided that vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other methods that didn't give that much time. Uh, and he also does in, in, in Corpus later on in the spoken language service, they use linguistic analysis. They explain what's going on. They, they expect people to have a basic understanding of, of grammar and ling linguistic analysis, and they use it to explain, as he's doing in these books, what the difficulties are going to be. And uh, having seen this, read this, and more recently uh, sort of took another look at the Pimsleur series of um, learn materials, which I had always kind of written off until I realized, hey, they've got not just eight cassettes or eight, eight levels, they've got 30 levels and five, five, five levels, and each of them has 30 lessons. There's quite a bit in there, but uh, I think that the Pimsa method is just a direct outgrowth of, of this here. Um, and then he finally he talks about the audiolingual approach of uh, recorded materials in language laboratories. In his time, I guess this was still relatively new. We take it for granted now, but... Um, I do think this is one relatively new way that people have had. People have always been able to listen to other people, but they haven't been able to have a recording of it and play it back and listen to it multiple times or do anything like shadowing with it or uh, you know, record themselves over listening to it and compare it. So uh, I do think that this is one way that um, modern technology, recording technology, has made a, a real change in, in language ways that we can learn languages. But these, this is all he gives, and this is just the smattering of ways. And so I, I, can't, I don't want to take too much time to go over everything else, but I think there's some other ways that are worth talking about. <clears throat> and they are, uh, this is again, I think this is so obvious that he, um, flaring a mission, I think he thinks he talked about it and didn't. He talks about teachers, but it's always sort of them sticking to the grammar method and the like. But it's possible to have a good teacher. It's possible to have a well-trained teacher who can do things with you that uh, you, you can't do on your own and that a, a teacher who doesn't know good methodology can do. So for example, teachers can do total physical response with you. And if you have somebody who is a, a total physical response is when they walk around and show you things and you do the same thing and you touch them. And so you get that motion, particularly if you're a kinesthetic learner, moving learner, it's, it's very helpful. Um, you can also do what I call prepared conversation launch. Um, this is if you have a trained teacher who knows what you're doing, and you, in particular, you've gone through a course like this, or you're a polyglot or polyliterate, you've learned many languages, you know what you're doing. You're not an, you're, you're a knowledgeable language learner and you have a knowledgeable teacher. You can do what I call prepared conversation launch, which is when you prepare the vocabulary and the basic structure that you need ahead of time. You're way over your head. But the teacher can hear that, feed it back, and then you can repeat along their lines. Um, I've taken most of the videos of my experience in, the, in, in my Finnish immersion experience down because they didn't really seem like they were contributing a lot. It seemed kind of childish, frankly, some of them. But I left two up that show precisely these things. There's one where I'm doing a nature walk with a total physical response. Uh, and there's one where I'm talking about religion and philosophy. Uh, in, in Finnish, well, after, I'm way over my head, I, I, but I've prepared what I need to know, and he knows what I'm trying to do, and he's feeding it back to me, and so I'm able to uh, engage in that conversation. And the end of that one, too, is another uh, wonderful young lady teacher. She's also totally aware that I'm aware of how I'm learning, and she's able to feed into it. So if you have a trained teacher, 
also I've mentioned. The only way to really get your phonetics down is if you work with somebody who knows how to explain things phonetically and you know it too. So uh, that's not to be neglected. Um, then there is the natural method. I think that's what it's called, particularly the most famous version of it is in the uh, Latin textbook, Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata, which takes the, it will only work for a language like Latin to another European language where there's so many cognates and so many words that we've taken from Latin that by starting with simple sentences, giving lots of pictures and illustrations, you can build up so that you can learn the language by only using the language. And I think this could work for other, um, other older medieval European languages as well too. So this is a possible way to, as I put here, resurrect the dead. Uh, and these can be used by a teacher or by yourself. And here we come to, again, I'm surprised that he didn't put it. Maybe spoken language services wasn't really a self-teaching method by his time, like it came afterwards, but autodidactic study. Auto methods are designed to teach yourself. There are so many books out there, self-teaching manuals. Um, it is so efficient and effective once you know how to learn a language to teach it to yourself. I have done a series review of, of 25 or so different uh, series. There are a lot of great things out there, but uh, I'm particularly fond, right in, in his time in the mid-1960s, Berlitz put out these self-teachers, these wonderful illustrated manuals where you had recordings only in the target language, and it was an interesting story that you followed, and you had bilingual text showing you everything you needed. I love linguaphone. I'm particularly fond of Asimil methods, which have bilingual text and target language only recordings. So these kind of autodidactic methods, uh, Asimil and linguaphone in particular, the recording might be two and a half or three hours long, and it's representative chunk of the language that goes from simple to relative, really pretty complex uh, understanding. And if you can take that and internalize that whole thing, you really do have a good foundation in a language. I just mentioned that Asimil works with bilingual texts. So now, coming to the learning of medieval languages, particularly for polyliterate folk who are interested in things like Middle High German or Old French, um, these books, these languages are so, so much easier to learn if you before you learn Middle High German, learn Modern German well. Before you learn Middle Old Medieval French, learn Modern French well. And then it boggles my mind that people would prepare these texts that are not in a bilingual form. If you can look at Medieval French next to Modern French, if you can go through the grammar and understand how it is, then you can compare and see them, and it brings the language to life so much faster than struggling through just looking at the, the grammars and primers that just give you the rules and then give you the, the text without the modern version next to it. So to me, this is the ideal way to uh, learn um, medieval languages. <clears throat> Bilingual texts are fine. Interlinear texts were also prepared very frequently in the mid-19th century, particularly for biblical languages, Hebrew and Greek and, and, and Latin. Uh, and this is also a great way to look at them and see, compare, you know, just to understand how the language works intuitively and using your intellect, seeing how they're there. Um, segue into other things. Comparative. If you, if you have an interlinear text with English and Hebrew, they don't really have anything in common. Common, but by comparing the translation, comparing what's said, you can figure out how the language works. Um, if you were to do this with, as I said here, with medieval French and modern French, you're looking at how the language is changing. You're looking at uh, the historical development of the language. And then you can do the two together, comparative and historical. When you look at different periods, you look at English, Old English, Middle English, Modern English together and understand how the language grows and, and changes. Uh, this can be a great springboard to learning not just those languages, but then going out and, and learning other languages, sister languages, cognate languages. And then, as Hall points out, and as I stress here and throughout my whole teaching, uh, once you get enough experience learning languages, then it ceases to be a challenge, becomes a question of putting in the time, and you can learn a lot more, a lot more effectively. 
He doesn't mention translating, which surprises me. This usually goes hand in hand with the grammar translation method. Uh, translating uh, depends on you, depends on the language you're learning, depends on lots of things. It can be a deadening, boring exercise, or it can be a really enlightening, eye-opening exercise. So the practice of translating uh, is certainly a time-tested, maybe a time-contested um, way of learning a language, but it shouldn't be left out. Translating is when you would take a sentence and translate it to or and or from the target language. Um, and finally, kind of goes like with these other things, there's the use of translations. Um, this is um, when you take a text. Um, it might be the Bible, it might be Sherlock Holmes or, or Harry Potter stories, something that is widely known and translated so that you can read it and understand it and know the content thoroughly uh, in your own language or in a language that you've learned well. And then when you're going to another language, uh, that would be far too difficult for you to understand another text at that level because you know the content already from the translation. This really facilitates the learning process. So um, we're at the end of chat part one at the one hour mark. Uh, I need to go a little over to finish. Sorry about that. Um, we have next time we're going to look at part two, the nature of language, and Hall's promise here is that we're going to get an understanding of what language is and how it functions, the problems involved in building new language habits, and minimizing the effects of old ones in learning the new. And there's chapter five, speaking and writing, speech habits, system and structure, meaning, and language and society. So <clears throat> I will prepare that for next Tuesday afternoon. And before that, I've mentioned this in previous videos, uh, what I've been doing since I have started making videos in earnest again uh, last month, seems a little bit longer than that, um, I have prepared a video and then I've taken comments. I get a lot of wonderful, serious, in-depth questions and comments in the comment section, and I've made a follow-up video uh, question and answer. And that is okay, but we're in this brave new world of using new technology in different ways. I wanna try something else, something different. I thought of doing a live stream uh, where I would sit there and you would send me ideas in chat, but I thought far better than that, and I've mentioned this already, what I'd like to do next time, this Friday, I would like to have a discussion circle on Zoom with people who are really interested in, in what I have to say in my channel and my videos, and there are a lot of people out there that that fit that bill, who I see um, you, when I put out my videos, you are engaging in a conversation in the comment chat with each other. You're answering each other. You're answering questions that people are posing to, to, to me, to others, and you're giving helpful information and you're supporting each other. And that's really just wonderful to see. So uh, I would like to bring us to life together and give us this opportunity to talk about some things. A discussion circle, for those of you who haven't experienced it, is, is a small, it's like a seminar, but even smaller. So we try to keep it to a, a handful of people uh, that are all on the same page. And in a seminar, uh, whenever you know, it really happens when you have 10, 12, 15 people around a table, some people dominate uh, and others maybe don't have anything to say, want to say something, but don't really get a chance. Uh, because a discussion circle is smaller and I, the moderator, somebody can try to make sure that everybody gets equal time to, to speak and contribute. So um, if everybody's prepared, I think that discussion circles are far and away the, 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 the best way of, of, of sharing minds. So I'd like to do that with some of you. I'd like to do that. Uh, I've noticed that the comments tend to come in pretty much right away. So if I put this out on Tuesday night, the comments usually come in on Wednesday and Thursday. The flood stops. Things keep coming in over time. People can watch these years later. I get comments on some of my videos, but the main comments I would say come in within the first uh, 24 or 48 hours. So uh, I would like to have this on um, next next Friday at uh, Friday. I'm in the afternoon in Central Time. I'm noticing that my the video seems to be going bad. I went over an hour. Maybe that's an issue. Um, that I would like to do this next Friday afternoon. I'm in Central Time uh, in US, that's Chicago time. I recognize that there are people all over the world that might wanna do this, that uh, maybe we can do some others at different times. What I would like you to do is look at the description uh, of this video 
Um, it has the, I've been talking about, I'm getting a new website. It's unfinished, uh, but uh, I've got the wonderful support of Christopher Stead out there in our community, uh, and we're working on getting it up. If you go there, there is a contact with an email where you can write to me and say, hey, I'd like to do this. Um, I'm being a bit cryptic about putting my email out. I've told that uh, spammers can get it, so I'm, you have to go in and dig for a little bit. But if you write to me and say you'd like to do this, uh, and there are enough people, I will choose a handful of people that are in the time zone. Uh, and my goal is to give everybody uh, who wants to do this a chance to do it. Um, so if you're not able to this time, then perhaps next time you can do it. Uh, and what I would ask and expect of people who are going to do this is that you don't just come and, and talk about what you want to talk about, but you help me go through the comments section, that everybody presents some ideas, uh, some comments, some concerns that other people who couldn't be there have voiced in the comment section. So uh, that is my goal and plan for this Friday. Uh, it's the first time I've tried to do this, that we've done this. Let's try it and see and hope that it works. Um, so I hope this was interesting and valuable to you. I thank you very much for listening, uh, for, for your interest in, in what I have to share with you. And uh, thank you and goodbye.